Even people like myself who were able to look past the problems that Gothic 3 had and could enjoy the game for what it was, usually draw the line at Forsaken Gods. Unlike the rest of the series, this expansion wasn't developed by Piranha Bytes, but by Trine Games, a studio which I could find out next to nothing about. And by the way, please excuse me if my voice sounds a little rough, I have fallen ill. I have a sneaking suspicion that Forsaken Gods has something to do with it, because this game is pretty horrible most of the time. Gothic 3 had a number of different endings depending on which decisions you made. In any case, however, the game offered a pretty conclusive ending to the Gothic saga and it probably should have been left at that. For an add-on, I think it would have been smarter to go down the Gothic 2 route, where Piranha Bytes expanded the base game with the Knight of the Raven. There really isn't much of a reason to continue the story at this point, but Trine Games attempted it anyway. Forsaken Gods begins where one of Gothic 3's endings left off, with the nameless hero and Zardus in the unknown lands. This was the ending that I chose for my review, so that wasn't much of a problem. But I also remember times when I had picked a different ending and I felt as though Forsaken Gods didn't respect the choices that I had made in the base game. In any case, a war is brewing in Mortana once again. The nameless hero is not a fan of this at all and returns to the real world in order to unite the land. What can I say, the story in Forsaken Gods is incredibly contrived. And just to give you a little example here, Gorn is in charge of the city of Gotha, but he's guarded by a corrupt gatekeeper. One of the big quests in Forsaken Guards is to collect 50,000 gold pieces in order to bribe the guard, so he lets you see Gorn. But then later in the game I had to deliver a letter to Gorn, which I had to hand over to the gatekeeper, who then made me do a couple of stupid quests for him. Even though I had already bribed the gatekeeper at that point and I could walk right up to Gorn. Another thing which didn't sit well with me is what Trine Games did with the hero's character. In Gothic 3 he frankly didn't have much of a personality at all. He was just a no-nonsense kind of dude who liked to get things done. You could play him as a good guy, you could play him as a bad guy, but he was ultimately a bit of a blank page. In Forsaken Gods, however, he feels quite different and not just because his voice actor has changed. He likes to think of himself as the savior and protector of the common people and generally has a really high opinion of himself. That seems out of line for him, but I could live with it. It gets really creepy, however, when he talks about how in his new Mertana there will be no place for weak people and all of that stuff. And during these moments it seemed to me that the nameless hero must have turned into a bit of a fascist in the unknown lands. In general the writing in Forsaken Gods is absolutely abhorrent. As I've talked about in my review of Gothic 3, I've never been the biggest fan of the way Piranha Bytes write dialogue, but it got the job done and didn't waste your time, unlike Forsaken Gods. The writing in this is just so unnecessarily wordy and there are so many annoying characters like that friggin' Birdman. Ah, ah, good day. Ah, uh, hello? And I absolutely believe this was done on purpose to make the game longer than it actually is, but I will talk about that more in a minute. The writing also has a negative impact on the quest design. What I liked about the main game was that quest givers described the mission so accurately that you really didn't need a summary or quest marker. This too doesn't apply to Forsaken Gods anymore. The quest descriptions are sometimes downright incorrect, or the subtitles will say something along the lines of go to the north, while the actual voice line will say go to the south and so on and so forth. I remember that when I beat this game for the first time, I had to rely on guides for certain sections because the game just isn't logically consistent. But out of all the game design sins that Forsaken Gods commits, for me the biggest one is that it breaks with a certain tradition that Gothic 3 established. In the main game almost everything is already there right from the beginning in terms of enemies and items. As a result, you could essentially complete a lot of quests without formally accepting them. I always thought this made for a very believable world, because it showed that things don't just revolve around the hero. In Forsaken Gods, however, things regularly only spawn in once you have accepted a quest. 
For instance, there is an orc camp right to the south of Geldern, which is uninhabited until you receive the order to destroy it. And this isn't a bad thing in literally 100% of cases. It's entirely realistic that not each and every person or object stays in place for the entire game, but Forsaken God simply overdoes it. Speaking of traditions which the add-on breaks, I've always been irritated by the open world design in this game. In Gothic 3 you could essentially run to the end of the world right at the start of the game and there would be people waiting for you with quests and the like. This was basically thrown overboard in Forsaken Gods. When you stray from the main story, you will encounter NPCs with individual names which indicate that they will become important later. But they don't have anything to say until you make progress in the main story. This is a problem because exploration isn't rewarded. If anything, it achieves the opposite effect. Alright, so Forsaken Gods is a pretty linear main story centered affair. That could be potentially not completely bad if the main quest was fun. But as you can probably guess at this point, it's not. Forsaken Gods is basically filler quests the game or backtracking the game. And just to give you an example here, at the start of the game you encounter a thief called Merrill in Silden. He wants to get an amulet from a merchant in Geldern. So you run to Geldern and talk to the merchant. Then you have to run back to Silden because the merchant will only give you the amulet if Merrill stops stealing from him. You sprint back to Geldern, get the damn thing and finally give it to Merrill in Silden. Make sure you find the teleporter stones to the cities or this will drive you insane. And this sort of quest is a regular occurrence in Forsaken Gods. And just like with the writing, I am absolutely convinced they are pulling this crap on purpose in order to make the game longer. And in this specific case you can't even put it off until later because as I explained, you need to make progress in the main story for the rest of the game not to be useless. The arguably worst type of quest in Forsaken Gods are escort missions and it sometimes feels like half of the game consists of them. The add-on regularly lets us lead a group of maybe half a dozen people from one place to another, which is a terrible idea. The pathfinding AI in Gothic 3 is bad enough for individual NPCs. Add in more people and you have to watch each and every one of them like a little child. And of course, if someone is lost along the way, you can't complete the quest, which means you have to run back and go get the missing person. Performance-wise, I probably didn't have quite as many bugs, but the frame rate was arguably even worse. An especially noteworthy thing was a cave, which made the game crash several times in a row whenever I tried to leave it. However, as some of you might know, I always try to be balanced in my reviews. So I asked myself, is there anything good about Forsaken Gods? And well, there is at least sort of. For one, the soundtrack and the world are still incredible. But I can't really attribute that to Forsaken Gods as those elements were taken from the base game. Well, Trine Games have placed some new buildings here and there, so Mertana does feel a bit different, but it's still the same world at its core. Speaking of Mertana, you might ask yourself, what happened to the other two continents, Nordmar and Berend? They are inaccessible now, or at least the developers thought they had made them inaccessible. Even attempting this is something that I have a weird baseline level of respect for, because there are several ways into Nordmar. And as for Berend, you can basically swim over to it from Etana. So it would take some pretty ingenious ideas to cut off Mertana from its two neighboring continents and make it seem believable. But it's safe to say Trine Games have taken the easy way out. You can't swim to Varant because an invisible wall prevents you from doing so. And the paths on the land are blocked by big rocks. Funnily enough, there is at least one of those boulders, the one in Faring, that you can jump over so easily it makes me wonder why they even put it there in the first place. Behind the rock you can see the invisible remains of what used to be Nordmar. Look, I don't want to call the developers lazy. Maybe some of those guys working there were actually talented and just weren't given any money or time. But there is a lot here which points towards laziness. For instance, the arena fights are more formulaic than ever. Teachers don't have unique lines anymore when you're learning skills, sometimes voice lines are missing entirely. And the perhaps funniest thing is when you encounter an orc with an awfully human-like sounding name and an awfully human-like sounding voice. A mission? All you mindless warriors running about with missions. But now I've gotten sidetracked once again. 
If there's one decent new feature, it would be the added weapons and armors. There's at least one new type of enemy as well. The swords that I used work without any trouble and the armor sets looked very appealing in the trader's inventory. In fact, the most fun I've had with Forsaken Gods was when I completely ignored the main story and just went hunting in order to grind money for new armor. At least once I had found an NPC who could teach me all of the hunting skills, which was harder than expected. But even when you just want to explore the world, Forsaken Gods is also worse than the base game in that regard, as Mertana feels way emptier. As a fan of Gothic 3, it is sometimes downright depressing to walk the lands of Forsaken Gods and witness what has become of this beloved world of mine. I could go on with my complaints about Forsaken Gods, but I have to make a cut here in the interest of my mental health and my physical health as well as you can maybe hear. Truth be told, I struggled to rate Forsaken Gods on its own merits. It was perhaps an unintentional stroke of genius to use Mertana as the background for the expansion, because I still get sucked in by the amazing world and soundtrack. But I always have to remind myself that those two saving races are not the doing of Trine games. Everything that's actually new in this standalone expansion is average at best, but usually pretty bad. The writing and the mission design especially are some of the worst I've ever seen, and the game, at least to me, becomes worse the more time you spend playing it. Initially my score would have been a 5 out of 10, but I eventually settled on a 3.5. And that was the Gothic series. I'm saddened we had to end on its lowest point, but at least we've got the Gothic 1 remake to look forward to. And I will probably review Arcania and its add-on too, so feel free to subscribe and we'll hopefully see each other again in my next video.